reading and collocation. Now, there are many words. There are many, many words in the English language. And some of these words we have seen. So many of the words in English you have not seen. Many of the words in English I have not seen. In fact, most of the words in English I have never seen. So of the words there are, I've seen some of them. Of the words I have seen, of the words you have seen, um, there are words that we understand. So there are some words that we've seen that we don't understand, and some words that we do understand. Of the words we do understand, there are some words that we can use. So there are some words that we, if we hear them, we understand them. If we read them, we understand them. But we would never say them or we would never write them. Um, and it goes back all the way to words that we don't know, we've never seen. And there are different kinds of levels. So as we as we learn more words, there are more words that we have seen. There are more words that we understand and there are more words that we can use. So um, let's just think of, of a few more examples of words. Let's um, let's think about um, this. So so what are these? Um, what are what are they called in Japanese? And uh, kanji de. Guys, as good as I. Good luck. Uh, let's ask some more questions. These these are grapes, by the way. They're grapes. Um, here are some more vocabulary questions. Uh, what is wine made from? Uh, Pinot Noir, Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnay are varieties of... Uh, what are Boudot in English? What's the common name for Vitis vinifera? Now, uh, you probably can get the answers to all of these questions. You, you probably notice there's a pattern that all the answers are the same and all of the answers are grapes. The first question is a, is a pretty general question. Most people will know that answer. Uh, the second question, those are all grapes, grape varieties that are used for making wine. So if you do drink wine, and if you like wine, you probably know all of these kinds of grape. Uh, the next one, if you can read Japanese, then you can answer this question. If you can't read Japanese, it's very difficult to get this question right. Um, and the final question is, that's the Latin name, the, the scientific name for grapes. So if you're a botanist or if you are a viniculturist, if you grow wine, then you may know this. Most people, uh, English speakers, don't know this word. Um, so as we can see, there are, there are many different um, there are many different things to know about this one word grapes. Um, and first of all, for um, the way the way language works uh, is there's a kind of triangle for vocabulary, that there's a connection between the meaning and the symbol that we use and the sound that we hear. Um, and the symbol and sound are often arbitrary. So there's nothing about the word grape, the sound of the word grape. There's nothing that really connects that to actual grapes. Um, and we have some connection between sounds and symbols often. But for example, um, kanji often don't really have a direct connection to the sound. Um, they have some kind of connection to the meaning, but the kanji is not the meaning. The kanji is the kanji. The symbol is the symbol. The sound is, is not the meaning. The sound is the sound. So language is all about this connection between these, these three things, between the, the meaning um, and the symbol and the sound. So when we, when we look at a word, um, when we say, do you know this word? One thing may be, do you know how to spell the word? Another question may be, what's the word in Japanese? Here's the English word. Do you know the Japanese word for it? 
Um, another question may be, what does it mean? And the meaning is not exactly the same as the Japanese word. Um, often you have a, a slightly different meaning. So a Japanese word has a different range of meaning to an English word. Uh, sometimes the um, English word will have a much narrower meaning and the Japanese word will have a broader meaning. Or sometimes the opposite. Um, sometimes the English word has a, a much broader meaning. The Japanese word uh, has a narrower meaning. Um, one example of this with the word belt, which in Japanese, uh, how would you say that in Japanese? Um, you'd probably say um, beruto. But if you do karate or judo, then you have, um, in English, that's called a belt. So you could have a black belt in karate, which in Japanese is called an obi. Uh, but if you're wearing jeans, you don't use an obi to hold up your jeans. You use a beruto. So we have a different, um, the Japanese word beruto is a bit narrower and the English word belt has a broader meaning. So this very often happens between English words and Japanese words. So we can't simply say here's the, here's the Japanese word, here's the English word, because it depends. Um, we then need to know um, what nuances does a word have. Does a word have a, a positive meaning or a negative meaning? Um, there are examples of this, like the word um, challenge. Uh, in English, challenge often has a negative meaning. Um, in Japanese, challenge often has a positive meaning. Uh, they're not the same word. Uh, they have a they're basic, they're similar word. It's a similar word, but the nuance is different. Or um, tension. Um, in Japanese, if you say tension wa takai, that's everyone's excited. Everyone's probably a bit happy. Um, in English, if you say there was lots of tension, it means there may be a fight and something bad may happen. People may get angry. So, the words have different different nuances, different a different spin on the word, whether it's a positive word or it's a negative word. We also need to know how to use the word. What situations do we use the word in? Uh, some words we use with our friends, we don't use with a teacher, for example. Um, some words are used if you're in a in a particular work situation, if you're working in a shop. Or if you're a customer in a shop, there may be different words that you use for the same thing. So words need to know the situation and words may be different in different situations or have different meanings. Um, those are just examples of um, different places. Another thing is which words go together with a particular word. Um, what are the words friends? And I'm just going to try an experiment now. I like experiments. And what's going to happen is you're going to see some Japanese sentences. I'm going to show you four sentences in Japanese. And you're going to see each of them for the same length of time. And I'd like you just to try and read them and see what happens. Are you ready? So, um, the first two sentences, which did you think was easier? Uh, these are both from uh, Natsume Soseki, by the way. Probably the top one you found easier, I, I guess. Um, and the I think this has easier vocabulary, so the kanji are easier. They're more familiar. The, the bottom one, I think, has more difficult kanji, so it's a bit more difficult, the difficult vocabulary. So this makes a difference. If, it, if, a, if a sentence has easy vocabulary, it's easier to read. 
if it's got difficult vocabulary, it's more difficult. Um, how about the next two then? These are these are these have no kanji, so there are no difficult kanji. It's all hiragana, katagana, all re really easy to read. Uh, which do you think of these was easier to read? Probably you're going to say this one. Um, now I wonder why and. Just to um, just by way of comparison, I've got the same the bottom sentence here, written in kanji. Um, and you you probably find this easier to read than the second sentence. And um, why is that? Why is it easier now? Before the the difficult kanji made it more difficult to read. Here, it seems almost like the kanji make it easier to read. Why would that be? Um, I think this is the reason. I think the reason is that we're familiar with these groups of characters. So we're used to seeing um, Omarani-san. We've read that as hiragana. And we're used to seeing Sori Daijin written as kanji. We're not used to seeing Kokusai Kaigi written in hiragana. Each of these characters is easy to easy to read. And similarly with Juyo no Hatsugen is, is not something that you would usually write in hiragana. It's not something you'd usually read in hiragana. Um, so I think what's happening um, in your brain is, um, what's happening I think is parallel processing. So when you read, um, you don't read like this. In fact, you read like this. So you can see several characters or maybe even several words in one go and your brain can process them all at the same time, not just one, 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 one. Um, so how do we read then? And to read, First of all, if you want to read quickly, you need to be able to do this parallel processing. So you need to be able to read the letters and process them in parallel inside your brain and recognize those groups of letters, those groups of words. Um, you can only recognize groups of letters and words by seeing them many times. So you won't recognize them unless you have seen them. And you can only see groups of words many times if you read a lot. And you can only read a lot if you read quickly. So we're kind of into, um, this is uh, the reading paradox. Um, in order to be able to read, we need to know the meaning of words. But to know the meaning of words, we need to read. So we need somehow to work this out. So I'm just going to talk a bit about collocation then, because uh, collocation is important. Um, if you're going to read, you need to know not just individual words, but you need to know how the words work together. And this means instead of reading word, 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 you can start to process words together as groups and as what are called collocations. Um, so let's just do some. Um, Translation, please. Uh, could you please think about? Here are some Japanese, Japanese phrases, um, nouns and verbs. Kutsu uh, haku, koto o kiru, megane o kakeru. Please uh, translate into English. Hopefully, you got answers something like this, uh, and you will notice. That here in English we have the same word. We've got wear shoes, wear a coat, wear glasses. In Japanese, there are three different words. Um, why is this happening? Well, we can look at this in terms of um, the semantic range. The English word wear has a bigger meaning, the Japanese words have smaller meanings. Another way to look at that is that these words are friends. So in Japanese, uh, these two words are friends. 
these two words are friends. But in English, these two words are friends. Um, another example, another few examples. Uh, this is kind of the opposite. Um, pan wo yaku. Tamago wo yaku. Sakana wo yaku. Yaku shite kudasai. Hopefully you got these answers. Um, bake bread, fry an egg, grill a fish. And again, we can look at this in terms of the semantic range. The Japanese word yaku has quite a big range with lots of different meanings. Uh, English has many more words. Or the other way to look at it is these words just go together. Um, we don't fry bread, we bake bread. Uh, we don't grill eggs, we fry eggs. And we don't bake fish, we grill fish. So these these words go together in these situations. Uh, more examples still of collocations. Um, for example, um, have a cold, make a mistake, take a train. Um, kaze o motsu. No? Uh, machigae o tsukuru. No? Um, densha or toru. Uh, we don't, so we don't have, we can't really translate these directly word by word. And also, unfortunately, there's not much logic often with collocations. There are two words that go together. There's no really good reason why those words go together. They just do. They're just friends. That's the way they are. Um, and we can look further. We can look at this. Um, this has been uh, Scott Thornbury has said this is words. If words are like animals, then they're like dogs or wolves. They go around together in little groups. They're not individual lone animals. And we can see this from the um, if we look at the we, before we looked at the top 10 words in English, um, the and to uh, of I, he, was she, it. We can also look at the top 10 double words. So if we see which pairs of words go together, uh, we've got of the, in the, it was. We can look at groups of three words that go together. I don't, there was a, one of the, it was a. Um, we can look at the groups of four words that go together. Um, I don't know. I don't think, I don't want, the end. What a very negative language English is. I don't know why you want to study such a negative language, but there it is. Um, there, so there, and there, there it is in terms of the words, the way that English works then is in these groups of words, these collections of words that go together. Um, and we can just do a, a little bit of maths. Um, the is about one in 20. So around every 20 words of English is the. And of is about one in 50. So of appears every 100 words, you're going to get five does and two ofs. And we would expect, if we did the sums, we would expect of the to appear together once every thousand words. Um, it, it doesn't, of the appears once every 200 words. If that was a word, it would probably be in the top 10. Um, and the of never appears. So these, these words are not going together at random. There's a pattern. Um, similarly, we can look at one. One appears once every 400 words or so. And um, one of the appears once every 3,000 words. If we do the calculation, we, if, if English was random, it would appear once every 400,000 words. But it doesn't. One of the is, is again, if that was a word, it would be a, a top 100 would be in the top 100. Um, so, um, here are some academic collocations then. If you're writing or reading academic English, then 
These are the kind of phrases you'll come across, um, assess the impact of, bear resemblance to, to be best described in terms of a broad range of, cast doubt on, to be clearly related to. So these are these are kind of set phrases. Um, they're not they don't really work as individual words. They work as if it was a single word. Um, and these are academic collocations. Um, how do we know then if we've read enough, then these collocations will sound right. So when we're writing, we know which word comes next. If you want to check, there is an academic collocation list. So you can check online for this. If you have a good dictionary, then it doesn't just tell you the meaning of the word. It also gives you a few sentences. And those sentences should tell you which words go together with the word that you're trying to use. Um, and we can also use Google. So uh, putting a phrase into Google and seeing how many times it appears will tell us how common that collocation is. And, whether we've got the right words to match together. Um, just for example, we can look at these, um, um, an experiment. Now, which, which of these do you think, which of these do you think is most, most common? Um, did an experiment, conducted an experiment, had an experiment, performed an experiment, made an experiment? Which do you think look best? Um, I've searched on Google for these. I searched on Google Scholar, and these are the number of hits for each one. Um, so we can see, one thing we can see is none of them is zero. So none of these is wrong. We can see that had an experiment is, is not very common in Google Scholar. We can see that performed an experiment and conducted an experiment are the most common. So these are the most useful collocations. These are the most likely things that you would write if you were writing a paper about an experiment that you did or an experiment that you conducted. And again, this is in Google Scholar. So this is in academic writing. If you're having a conversation with somebody, then you probably would say I did an experiment. So the different different words are being used differently in different situations. So um just to go just a conclusion then um first learning vocabulary is a complex process. It's not just a simple ah oh, here's a word I need to learn this word da 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 I've learnt it. There are many many steps and there are many things to learn about the word, not just the meaning. We need to learn the collocations. We need to learn which words go together with this word. Uh, we need to learn, learn about relationships. So how do these words work together? And I guess learning words in their environment. So find out where the words live. They don't, the words don't live, English words don't live in a Japanese dictionary. If you're looking in a Japanese dictionary, then you can only find a Japanese translation of a word, and you may only find a single word. You may not learn very much about the collocation, about how the word works with other people, about what situations the word is being used in. To learn those things, um, reading, <laughs> I think, is the best way to learn about words. Of course, speaking, listening are very helpful, but reading you will learn how words work and which words they work together with. So reading is the best way to learn about words. Um, also, of course, reading um, is the only way to learn how to read. You need to read. You need to read to learn to read. Um, and very importantly, you need to read at the right level. So if you're reading books that are too difficult, then you don't get you don't get through. You don't read enough. You don't read the quantity. You don't read fluently. 
and you need to read a lot. To, to learn how to read, you need to read a lot. So the reading level is very, very important. Um, so what's your reading level? Please go and have a think about your reading level. And I will see you later.